This event was sponsored by Spock, the Bootsy Lab for Beautiful Things, PS PDF Kit. With the JavaScript library, you can view and annotate PDF files in the browser. Features include cross-browser support, mobile-optimized UI, and no server-side component. Wild, a digital branding studio, they love GIFs, beer, and weird shit. XXX Lutz, the tech team, XXXL Digital creates all digital experience for XXL Lutz, Mobilix, and Momax all over Europe. Good evening. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. Thank you for inviting me. And um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Side note, I was offered beer earlier, and now I'm really glad I didn't take any because it's really warm in here. So <laughs> if I had drank any, I'd be like really bright red. Okay. So, oh. Okay. Hi, my name is Shirley. I'm a freelance software engineer based in the San Francisco Bay Area and I build data visualizations for the web. I built them for product, I built them for story, I use all D3, and for most of my projects, I also use React with my D3. So when I mention React with D3, most of the time I get asked, how should we use React and D3 together? Who gets control of the DOM? And I want to rephrase that a little bit to who needs control of the DOM? After all, React has the virtual DOM, so it definitely needs access to the DOM. <laughs> and D3 is for building data visualizations in the web. So, of course, it also needs access to the DOM, right? No, actually, it actually turns out that D3 only needs access to the DOM in three different areas. First, the transitions or animations from one state to the next. So in this case, we give D3, we tell D3 the attributes that we want to transition, and D3 helps us calculate all of the in-between states, all of the interpolations, and D3 goes in and updates the DOM directly for us so that we don't have to. The second is with axes. So it gets to be quite a repetitive task for us. If every single time we wanted axes, we needed to go and render all of those ticks and all of those labels in SVG or Canvas. So we just tell D3 what we want, and D3 goes and renders them directly to the DOM for us. And finally, there's brushes. So just like the axes with brushes, it's also very tedious if every single time we wanted them, we have to go and create the draggable area, that little box, um, and we have to you know, uh, register all of the event listeners. So again, we tell D3 what we want, and D3 does it for us in the DOM. So for all of those things that we so commonly associate with D3, things like layouts, so the force layout, the chord diagram, the tree maps, things like geo, projections, mapping, and shapes, so line charts, pie charts, all of that, those things that we so most commonly associate with D3, they actually don't need access to the DOM. Instead, what happens is that we tell D3, we give D3 our raw data, and D3 actually gives us back that same data, but now with more information about how to render that data into screen space. So the way that I like to think about D3, the, really the magic and power to D, about D3 to me is that it helps us transform raw data. Let's say, for example, the average temperature of a city across time. It takes that raw data and transforms it into screen space, into XY coordinates, into radii, into colors. And that, to me, is the magic of D3. Because then I like to think of it as D3 helps me take care of the more repetitive common tasks of building data visualizations in the web. Which means that for most of our use cases, we can have React do all of the rendering and D3 doing all of the data calculations. And it's only when we need those three things that we mentioned before, the transitions, the axes, the brushes, it's only when we need those that we have D3 both do the calculations and the rendering, and we can have React kind of hanging out for support. 
So before we get going on how to use React and D3 together, I want to take a step back and talk about the why. Why are we trying to use React and D3 together? After all, if all we want is a visualization, D3 is actually more than enough to do the job for us. Take, for example, this visualization I made last year of all of the top summer blockbusters in the last two and a half decades. Each of the petals are parental guidance ratings, each of the colors are genres, and the size and number of petals indicate their IMDb ratings out of 10. So there's some really, really beautiful ones in here, like The Dark Knight Rises. I always really like Harry Potter. Um, there's Inception. But my absolute, absolute favorite, the one I always tell everyone, is the 1997 Batman <laughs> and Robin. Oh, oops. Because of how adorably cute and tiny it is. <laughs> But the only user interaction in this piece is a click interaction to open up the corresponding IMDb page. <laughs> so this is another visualization I did last year called the four years of vacations in 20,000 colors, where I took four years of my vacation photos, about, I think, 4,000 images. I extracted the top five primary colors out of each of those pictures, and I grouped those colors by the trip and arrange them by the date that it was taken on in that trip. And this is one of my favorites. It's a pretty simple visualization, but it's one of my favorites just because of I learned so much about myself in this visualization, mainly that um, when I travel, I really love taking pictures of nature. So things, you know, waters and skies, and especially water and like trees and hills. So all of these blues and greens made a lot of sense to me. But I was really confused as to why there was like so much oranges and reds because there was no way I was taking that amount, that proportion of sunrises or sunsets, right? Like I don't even wake up for sunrises. So I went and looked into what those oranges and reds were, and it turns out they're food pictures, which means that, um, for example, in this 2014 trip to Japan, apparently all I did was eat. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then this one, this trip was my first trip to Iceland, my only trip to Iceland. And you can see I took, there was a lot of water and I went really happy and there was a lot of blues. And you can probably also tell all I do in New York, in New York is also eat. Um, so I learned a lot about myself. But um, you can probably also tell the only interaction in here was a hover interaction to give you more details about that trip and that day. So the way that I think about it is D3 is more than enough to do the job if all I want is a visualization with very simple interactions like hover or click. But if we want to go a step further, if what we want is a whole UI built around that visualization, then React, then React is a great, great library for the job. So I built this very simple expense app as an example to show how React and D3 can be used together. So each of these circles are categories. Each of these white little dots are my expenses. This is actually my expenses. It's kind of embarrassing. Um, so each of these are expenses, and they're grouped by uh, the date that the expense was made and the color. Their color. The dates are colored by how much I spent on that date. So Red is bad because I spent so much, and um, green is better because I didn't spend that much on that day. I can toggle between each of the weeks. I can drag one expense to another to edit the date, and you can see that the background color automatically updated. You can drag it back, of course. I can also drag a, an expense over a category to categorize that expense. I can drag it over again to uncategorize the expense. Let me show you my favorite part. So um, this, this interaction is my favorite. So um, I can add a category, so maybe like parking, and then I just hit enter, and then it goes in there. I don't know. Uh. 
I was really happy. I don't know. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I was really excited, like a little too excited. So I don't know. I can say also coffee. And then, yeah. So it goes in there. And I'm really happy about that interaction. You can also um, drag it over to delete those categories. So yeah, this is my very simple expense app that's not, that should not be productized ever. But um, so in this case, I'm using React to help manage updates, um, to help manage updating my visuals with each user manipulation of the underlying data. I also have this visualization I made last October for, and this is viewer brain data. So this is uh, with a company called BrainSights, and it's viewer brain data as they watch the final US presidential debate. And at the very top, I have an overview. So each of this line chart is the overall um, user engagement as they watch the debate. The background colors are um, the, pe the person speaking. And I can, oh, it's slow right now. I don't know why. But I can drag. Oh, there we go. I can drag to look into any, I can drag this brush to look into any part, kind of dig into any part of the debate. I can select a demographic group. And then I can hover over. Oh, this is not, OK. I can hover over to see the details of that specific moment. So for this particular example, React helps me link multiple parts of the visualization together so that a user interaction in one part will affect and update the visuals in all the other parts. And finally, I have an example this is an interactive visualization of every single line in the musical Hamilton. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of it here. Oh, yes, like five people. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is every single one of those dots represent a set of lines in the musical. So this is, you can hover over them to see them. And as the user scrolls down, on the screen, the dots follow. And then they highlight the appropriate places as I present my analysis. They can also interact with parts of the filter. And then I don't know if sound is going to work, but if you click on this, you can see, oh, so imagine more in the background because <laughs> it's washed out a little bit. But um, yeah, you can see faint outlines. I'm glad. And finally, I give the user the filter tool at the very end where they can filter by any set of characters, conversations, and themes so that they can dig into the remaining lines and songs themselves to do their own analysis. For this one, I use React to manage the initial scroll down the screen, as well as the final exploratory tool. So I use React with D3 when I need to componentize my visualizations and manage the state as the user interacts. So now that we've talked and covered the why, let's go back to the how of using React and D3 together. So the way that I like to think about my visualization components are as self-contained components where if I pass in raw data to that component, the component will take care of translating that data into screen space, render that data, and manage any user interactions with that data. So let's take, for example, this uh, very simple example of a graph, where the only interaction is this update button that changes the node and link graph. And being able to click on any of the nodes to show the neighbor to highlight the neighboring nodes and links, so to update the opacities of those neighboring nodes and links. And let's start with the code for React doing the rendering and D3 doing the calculations. 
So this is all of the code. The code has an app component and it has a graph component. And don't worry about like reading through the whole thing because all of the code is online and I'll tweet it out. Either I'll, I'll give the link to the organizers to post. We posted on the meetup page. Oh, you're awesome. Thank you. Um, so yeah, it's apparently on the meetup page. Not yet. Oh, we'll be on the meetup page. So don't worry about reading through the code. So the app component itself is in charge of loading in the graph component and then in charge of the update button. And it's in charge of handling any updates to the data anytime the user clicks on that update button. And the graph component is in charge of getting that data that's been passed in as prop from the parent app component and getting that data and calculating using D3 force layout to calculate the X and Y positions of each of the nodes and links. And for best practice, over the years I've, I've developed a little bit of best practice where I keep a very, very clear distinction between the data calculations and my visualization component, which is in charge of any calculation that has to do with the visualization itself, about rendering that visualization into screen space, and everything else, any other updates to the data, edits, manipulations to that data, that doesn't have to do with the visualization is handled elsewhere, in this case in the app component. I take that calculated data, I take the XY coordinates, and I pass it in and loop it through, loop through it in a render function and create my SVG circle and line components and then return it in the render function. And I, of course, I, I, I call the calculate data function before the render function, sorry, I ca call my calculate data function before the render function in my React lifecycle. That made sense, right? That was a mouthful. OK. Um, and I do that from component will mount and component will receive props. And the reason why I like doing it in component will receive props is for performance reasons. Because with component will receive props, it's only ever called when the parent passes in props for me, which means that there's been a user update to the data. There's been an, some sort of an update to the data. And not when there's set state on the component itself. And this helps avoid unnecessary data recalculations for me. And there's also the added benefit in component will receive props that if after calculating all of my data, I want to set that data as state, it doesn't have an extraneous, it doesn't trigger an extraneous React lifecycle. And for that user interaction of selecting a node, all I have to do is set that selected node, the data of that selected node as state, and then calculate which nodes and links are the neighboring are the neighbors that should be highlighted. So I calculate that data in my render function so that I can pass it in to when I'm creating my SVG circles and lines, I can pass it in to update their opacities. So when React does the rendering, if the user interaction does mutate the data, propagate that change from the parent and calculate, recalculate that data and component will receive props. And if the user interaction does not mutate the data, like in the case of selection or hovering, set state in the component and calculate and render. So now let's take a look at when D3 is doing both the rendering and the calculation with that exact same example. So the app component remains exactly the same, but the graph component changes significantly. The biggest change being in the render function where we no longer return the SVG circles and lines, and instead we return an empty SVG container. We then take that empty container and pass it in to D3 and wrap it into a D3 selection so that later on D3 can use it in the render, in the render code. And in both component did mount and component did update, I call my calculate and render graph functions. So the calculate data function remains exactly the same as the previous example where I use D3 force layout to calculate my X and Y positions. 
But what's changed is that I've taken that calculation for the highlighting, figuring out which nodes and links are the neighbors of the selected node. I've taken that out of the render function and into the component did mount and component did update. So that, that's important because I can then use it in my D3 render code. I can use that calculated data in my render, in my D3 render code, where I'm figuring out the nodes and links to enter and update and exit. And I can use that information to, to set the opacity on my nodes and links. And here, for best practice, the thing that I try to keep in my mind as I write my D3 render code is that my code, my, that code should always, always define exactly what the visualization should look like given any props or any state on the component, much like how I would think about um, what to return in a React render function. So that if in the future I want to add a new feature or a new in user interaction, all I have to do is change the data, manipulate the data, and then all of the visualization will be rendered correctly with very little additional code change. And finally, for the user interaction of selecting a node, the code looks exactly the same as before where I set state, I set that node as state on the component. And when I first started, I had a really bad habit of just doing the D3, the render update in this event callback, where I kind of just updated the opacity right here in event callback. Um, and then over the year, over time, I realized that it was much cleaner to just set that state and let the React lifecycle take care of rendering the correct visualization for me to like have the component did update what I set up in component did update do the uh, to to render the right visualization for me and finally a small small note on performance so I like to use true component update if ever a user interaction triggers something that doesn't need a full recalculation of the data or a full re-rendering of the visualization. And in that case, I do the subset of the calculations and renderings that I need. In this case, um, here all I'm doing is saying um, if the if something has been, say, hovered, or say, sorry, if something has been selected, just only calculate what should be highlighted and only update the opacity return false so that I can exit out of my life cycle early. So when D3 is doing the rendering, define exactly what the visualization should look like in com component did mount and component did update. And never, ever, ever, ever let D3 and React control the same parts of the DOM or else very heinous bugs for really long time in the afternoon. So by this point, after all this, you might be like, WTF, Shirley. This is exactly what I do. Like, this is exactly what I do in my day to day. This is exactly the same kind of thought process I go through day to day. And when I create my non-data visualization, non-visualization components, React components. And you're exactly right. And that's also exactly my point, which is that even though as front-end developers, the design of data visualization might be quite foreign to us, the actual coding, the implementation of it in the browser is exactly like any other UI project. The thought process that we have to go through of architecting it is exactly the same as what you already go through day to day. So when we talk about the how of using React and D3 together. There's already a lot of really great literature out there covering this topic, but we still haven't seemed to agree on the one best approach. And I think that's perfectly okay, because to me, what's important is that you and your team agree on the best approach for your project. So, and this brings me to my final point, which is that I'm really excited, even though, so even though the 
so there's there's been a lot of um, there's been a lot of progress that's been made in in terms of the design of data visualization. But when it comes to the actual implementation of it in the browser, it's been in the browser for a few years. I'm really excited to see what can we apply to D3 and data visualization that we already do with React and the UI. So as we go forward, I'm excited and I'm hopeful that we'll stop concentrating so much on the how of using React and D3 together, but instead start concentrating on the what. What can we do with D3 and data D3 and React that will push the practice and the field of data visualization and user interface forward? Thank you.